Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hillsdale Church. We're happy that you're here with us this morning. Welcome to everyone watching online. Would you all stand with us and we're going to pray and get started with worship. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning grateful that we're able to worship you together as the body of Christ. We come recognizing that you are willing to meet us right where we are. You're willing to meet us in our gratitude, in our celebration, in our praise, in our worship for you. And you're also willing to meet us with our frustrations and our grief and our uncertainties. I thank you that you never demanded that we show up as something other than what we are and that you are willing to work with us, to heal us, to invite us into more. We ask that our ears would be open to just that this morning, that our hearts would be sensitive to your calling, that we would be willing to listen. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Let's sing together this morning. Darkness tries to roll over my bones With sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. Oh, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I. Stand in your love. Oh, oh, oh. There's 
Oh, yeah. 
This time, y'all can be seated, and I would like to invite our children up to the stage to join Kaylee and Noah for children's time. Miss Christy is out of town because her son graduates this weekend, and y'all are in for a treat this morning. Good morning. I'm Kaylee, and today I'm going to be covering for Miss Christy. I am 12 years old and I'm in sixth grade. I actually also come here for youth at Hillsdale. So in youth last week, we took some time to remember some truths about God and things that we're thankful for. Let's try it. Tell me some truths about God. Raise your hand if you can think of one. God loves you. God won't stop. Mm -hmm. He died for our sins. Yes, he did. God died on the cross. Let's see if we can bring it over here. He took care of us. He took care of us. All those things are truths about God. Let's see what the youth came up with. So God loves us. God is all-knowing, God is always with us, God knows best, God is kind, God created life, and God gave us his one and only son. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Who can tell me something that they're thankful for? God. That's a good thing. I like dogs. Family. Mm -hmm. Love. Mm. Nature. Yes. Do you want down there? Okay. Here are some of the things that the youth are thankful for. Creation, good friends, forgivefulness, reassurance that God is here no matter what. <laughs> that God is always listening. And look at how many things that we know are true about God. Look at how many things that we're thankful for. What a cool way to start your week knowing that God loves you and God is always with you and he is all knowing. It's something we want you to always remember. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these children being able to be here today, and thank you for everybody who came here, and um, I just wanted to say that I hope Miss Christie has a fun time at her graduation, in Jesus' name, amen. You guys can head on out that way. Everybody give it up for Kaylee one more time. She's in sixth grade. I would have never done something like that in sixth grade. We're so proud of you, Kaylee. Um, yeah, like she said a, a couple of weeks ago, we, we broke off into small groups at youth and, and we talked about what are the truths about God and what are some things that we can be grateful for and in that see God in our life. So what you just saw on the screens, that um, is what we're currently doing in youth. I have a couple of announcements before we read the scripture this morning. First of all, um, a couple of months ago, we started this fundraiser called Adopt an Egg. And this was a fundraiser that went towards the mission trip for this year. And I was expecting to maybe make like a couple of thousand at the most. And I'm excited to announce that we raised over $10,500. So, yes, I was 
completely blown away. What happened a lot is like a lot of you guys who donated, you were like, okay, I'm going to donate, but I'm not going to take an egg. So then everybody else thought like, oh my gosh, there's so many eggs to adopt left. And so you just kept giving and giving and giving. So that, that being said, if you donated towards this, thank you so much with your help. We, are, we were able to fund over 80% of everyone's trip going on the mission trip this year. So thank you again. If you, if you did uh, donate, uh, be on the lookout. In, uh, next week, the youth who are going on the trip, we're going to hand make and write and decorate cards and send them out to you. So be on the lookout for that. My next announcement is June 5th, Sunday, June 5th. That's in a couple of weeks. We're having our graduate Sunday for all college and uh, uh, high school students who are graduating. So that is June 5th. You can come either to the 9 a.m. service or the 1030. We're going to be honoring and recognizing our graduates at both services. If you would like to sign up your child or someone you know who is graduating, um, college age or high school, feel free to email me at noah at hillsdaleumc.com. And um, even if they can't make it, we would love to send them a, a, a gift as well. So again, you can email me at noah at hillsdaleumc.com. Uh, my last announcement is that this Tuesday, we're having a blood drive that is May 17th from 1 to 6.30 p.m. And the last time I checked, we had like 12 spots left. So there's quite a few uh, uh, spots to fill. So if you're interested, you can sign up with your little connection card. You can go to our website and then be led to Red Cross, uh, uh, the Red Cross Blood Drive. Or you can just go to redcrossblood.org, I believe. Anyway, I would rather go to the connection card because I wouldn't, I wouldn't take my word for it. But also, if you're in high school, I heard that Davy High is, has an early release this Tuesday, so if you want to give blood, now's your chance. Yes. You do have to be 16, and if you're under 18, you do need a permission slip. So if you're interested, high schoolers in the building, if you're interested in donating blood, uh, just come see me afterwards. I have the little permission slips in my office that you can, uh, yeah, you can take home and, and fill out. So that is all my announcements. We're going to be reading out of the book of Mark, and we're going to be in Mark chapter 10, if you want to flip there, if you have your Bibles. Uh, I'll give you just a second for that. And I actually wanted to do something before we read the scripture. I'm going to give you a little more time if you have your Bibles to flip to Mark chapter 10. We're going to be reading in verse 17 and ending at 27. Mark chapter 10, 17 through 27. Something that we do at youth on Wednesday nights whenever I teach, um, either before worship or be before we read scripture, the youth are crazy, let me tell you. So they need to like a second to take a deep breath and just like relax. I'm sure if you have children, you know what I mean. So I, I was just thinking about it last service, and I would like to do this with us. Before we read scripture, I'd like everyone to just take a deep breath. Are you guys ready? Okay, let's take a deep breath. And out. Let's do one more to, to allow the, the racing thoughts to kind of just go away. Let's breathe one more time. And out. I found that it helps the youth concentrate on what is going on in Scripture, and I think that it could help each of us as well. So we're in Mark chapter 10, verse 17. It says this. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. 
You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. This amazed them, but Jesus said again, Dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you that we can hear your voice through these scriptures. And we just say that we want to give you everything this morning. Maybe, maybe it goes further than even just money. Holy Spirit, I ask that in this next song as we're singing, that you begin to highlight the areas of our lives that we need to just give to you. We love you so much, Jesus. I ask that you bless these tithes and offerings. In Jesus' name. At this time, I'd like to invite our ushers forward for tithes and offerings.
It flows in rivers. What you call a treasure? This world calls a curse. The small become greater. The last become first. Your kingdom is backwards. Lord, teach us to serve. As it is with your kingdom, let it be with your church. everyone. My name is Tori Elliott Gingrich. I'm one of the pastors here at Hillsdale. And um, when the, well, when Kaylee was talking about the things that we're grateful for, and um, one of the kids said nature, I think. Um, it, I relate to that very, on a very personal level. Specifically, I think that there are moments in my day-to-day -day life when either I catch like a pretty bird, not catch, literally catch sight of, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not that kind of girl, but um, you know, see just these moments like watching um, a butterfly fly by or a pretty sunset. And I had one of those moments yesterday where I just was taken aback and I thought, oh my gosh, like, Yes, this is God's creation. I feel um, the presence of the Holy Spirit looking at this. And it was after the storm, there was a rainbow. Did anyone catch the rainbow yesterday? It was so pretty. This was the rainbow outside of the church. And it's a double rainbow. You can't really see. It looks better on this projector to your right. Um, now, I love everything about this scene. We are so blessed to have this baptismal out there. I don't know if y'all were here two weeks ago, two weeks ago, when we worshiped outside, and it just, it's such a blessing to have that out there and to see just the faithfulness and the promise of God displayed over our church, um, over that scene outside is really beautiful. So I didn't take this photo. It's Teresa's daughter who took it, and she sent it to Jerry. Jerry sent it to me, and I said, oh, I've got to show it on Sunday morning. So anyway, I hope that y'all, if you weren't able to catch it yesterday, be on the lookout because we get the best rainbows right in that spot out there over that hill. So anyway, now on to the sermon. That was just a little aside. Um, we have been going through the book of Mark for the past three weeks. If you have missed any of our um, any of this current sermon series, which is normal, doesn't live here anymore. I encourage you to go on our website. You can watch any of those messages that Jerry has preached for the past three weeks. And this is our last week of this sermon series. Normal doesn't live here anymore. And before we take a look at the text that Noah read for us this morning, I want you to ask yourself the question, how do I define normal? So think about it for a second. What do you consider to be normal? What, what is your definition of normal? Over the course of my life, I can pinpoint the seasons where my definition of normal was kind of turned upside down on its head. One of them obviously being the pandemic. I think everyone had to kind of rewrite the definition of normal for themselves throughout that season. But specifically what I'm talking about is when I graduated high school and I moved out of my hometown. 
Now, I grew up in a very small hometown, very small town of Chillicothe, Ohio. All of my friends were very similar to me. We had similar interests. Our family dynamics were um, pretty similar. Most of them came from, um, we all went to the same church. We went to the same school. It was just one of those situations. I was surrounded by a lot of uniformity, not a lot of diversity. We were all kind of like-minded in that way. And so naturally, my definition of normal was what is like me? What thinks like me? What talks like me? What grew up in the way that I did? And then when I moved out of my small town and I began to meet people who grew up in different family dynamics, different cultures, different states, different countries, some were a part of different religions, and the kicker to me was becoming friends with people who were Christian but of a different denomination than I grew up in. And when I started to encounter these people with all of these differences and also recognizing that, that some of these people have thoughts about God that I was growing from, learning from them, that I was growing as a Christian, learning from them. And I realized that my definition of normal was so specific to my own life experience that often it left me boxing myself in. It created barriers between me and people who weren't like me. And when we often put barriers between us and other people, a lot of the times we're also putting barriers between us and God. When I was saying, oh, that's not normal, what I was really saying is, that's not right. That's not right. I'm right. The way I grew up is the only right way. Everything about it. My way of life is right. My way of life is the standard. And in doing so, I was missing out on beautiful relationships with other people and also putting a box around God that said, this is who God is. This is what God can and can't do. This is how God will or won't do these things. And I was unwilling to learn until I began to, my worldview was kind of expanded. Let me tell y'all, if you would have told me at 15, 16, 17, one, that I would end up being a pastor, I would have laughed. If you would have told me I would end up being a minister in the United Methodist Church, I probably would have slapped you across the face. Honestly, I grew up in a very charismatic non-denominational church that was right across the street from a United Methodist Church, and I always said, I will not go there because they're not normal, all right? I thought the way that y'all did things was backwards. I didn't get it. I didn't, I didn't understand the liturgy. I didn't understand the tradition. Hy singing hymns on a Sunday more, absolutely not. It just, I was so used to and so convinced that my way of life was the standard was the norm that I would even consider people of other denominations somehow a little less Christian than me. Messed up, right? Thank God my definition of normal was kind of blown out of the water um, at a youngish age. I followed this woman on TikTok, which for those of you who don't know, TikTok is a social media platform, okay? Uh, it's videos. You watch videos uh, for worse or for better. Some of us are on TikTok. I'm on TikTok. And there's this woman named Abby who is my age. She's maybe, maybe a year or two younger, but she's autistic. And I love to watch her videos. She just, her, she and her mom make videos together about her day-to-day -day life and um, you know, how she grew up, and a few months ago, she got to go on her dream vacation, which was a cruise, and on the cruise was this, there were these water slides that she was terrified to go on, but she really wanted to go on, and then she finally conquered her fear, and Abby went down the water slide, and so after Abby went down the water slide, her mom was interviewing her, and she was like, Abby, you finally did it. How do you feel? And Abby said, I feel so good. 
I feel normal. And without missing a beat, Abby's mom said, what's a different word than normal that we can use here? And Abby said, I feel so good, I feel brave. And she said, brave, that's a great word. And when I watched that video, I was like, this is very interesting. And sure enough, a few videos later, her mom posted kind of an update, a reasoning why their family stopped using the word normal years ago. And she said, a lot of what we're talking about this morning, the word normal is often used to shame other people. It's used to alienate other people. It's used to draw lines in the sand and create these boxes that says, this is what's normal, this is what's not. Outside, obviously, of like medical term texts. I'm not trying to say any doctors need to say things are normal or not normal, but in a social setting, in a cultural setting even, in a religious setting, this is normal, this is not. And what Abby's mom said is when they consciously stopped using the word normal, they were making a statement saying just because Abby is different doesn't mean that she doesn't meet the standard. Abby has something beautiful to offer society. Abby also reflects the heart of God. See, Jesus, in the course of his ministry, he was consistently overturning societal, cultural, and religious norms, left and right. It's one of the reasons why he gained a following, and it's also one of the reasons why people hated him so much. He was on all fronts redefining, or really not even redefining, he was kind of smashing all together this definition of normal, of what the norm was. And the Holy Spirit is still doing so today. And when we enter into discipleship, when we commit to the Christian life, what will happen over and over and over again over the course of our life is that the Holy Spirit will say, hey, we're going to redefine, we're going to kind of take the sides off the box and see what happens. And I hope that if you've been following along with the sermon series that maybe you felt that way over the past couple of weeks. It's a good and a healthy place to be in. In the passage that Noah read for us this morning, we see this story of the rich man, the wealthy man that comes to Jesus. And now some of us might be listening to this passage and, and thinking, I know what's in my bank account. This sermon's not for me, right? Wealth is not one of the struggles I have. We're all good there. But this is not necessarily a commentary on just wealth itself, although there are some very valuable truths about money and how money affects our humanity when we have a lot of it. But more than that, this passage is a commentary on idolatry, on the things that we hold white-knuckled, unable to let go of, that prevent us from fully connecting with God and living in relationship with God. We see this wealthy man come to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now remember, we've talked about this before. Um, at the time, their concept of eternal life was much more broad than what we think of. It's not just talking about heaven or an afterlife. Eternal life was something that they understood started here and now and then continued on after death, life with God, you know. So he's not saying, what must I do to go to heaven once I die? He's saying, how can I partner with God right now and then continue to do so for all of eternity? How can I live this life within the eternal God? And Jesus says, well... You know the commandments, keep them. And he says, I've kept the commandments. I've done that since I was a kid. And then Jesus is filled with genuine love, compassion, kindness towards this man. And he says, then sell everything you own, give it to the poor, and follow me. And as we know, the man can't do it. He won't do it. And he leaves Jesus where he is. 
And Jesus says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. It's easier to bottle up the entire ocean in a two liter than for the wealthy to inherit the kingdom of God. And the disciples, it says, are astonished. But really, I would even go as far as to say they were flabbergasted. They were confused. And they're like, well, if he can't do it, who can? And something we have to understand about the mindset of the disciples at the time, there was this way of thinking that said, if something bad happens to you, it's God punishing you for something that you did or something that your ancestors did. Like think about the story of Job in the Old Testament, right? His friends come to him and they're like, whatever you did, repent for it and the bad stuff will stop happening. There was this idea that if anything bad is happening to you, it's because of something that you did. Now, the other side of that coin was if good things are happening to you, if you're wealthy, if you're blessed on earthly terms, it's because God's happy with you. You did something good. Pat yourself on the back. The Lord has gifted you with these riches. And when the disciples saw this man, not only is he wealthy, but he also knows the scriptures. He's willing to follow Christ and he has kept the commandments that were given to him. They're thinking this guy is like number one option to be able to inherit eternal life. He's like first in line to enter into the kingdom of God. What If he can't do it, then who can? And Jesus says, it's not humanly possible, but with God, it's possible. Now, to further understand the disciples' mindset at the time, we have to even jump back a little further. Um, this is verse 13. So we read in verse 17. This is just a few verses beforehand, this story. Mark chapter 10, verse 13 says, One day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them, but the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. And when Jesus saw what was happening, he became angry with his disciples. And he said to them, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never have it. So again, we see this mindset that the disciples have, that it's, if you're blessed, it's because you did something good to earn God's blessing. Children at the time in society, they were almost like the lowest of low, like subhuman, because they had nothing to contribute to society yet. Their only job was obeying their parents and making sure they survive into adulthood so that they can actually matter so that they can contribute something to the world. They were a bother. They were not to get in the way. And the disciples are thinking, these children have nothing to offer Jesus. These kids are bringing nothing to the table. I think about my nephew, Louis, who is, he's about to be four, and he, I might be biased, but he is like the cutest thing to have ever walked the planet Earth. But he doesn't, as far as like, um, you know, productivity goes, he's not bringing a whole lot to the table. <laughs> and he really likes to help, help. And so what will happen is if you're doing a task and he's like, TT, let me help. I'm like, okay, well, this is going to take double the amount of time than if I could just do it myself. It's not really helping, right? Kids, they don't have anything to offer for a long time, but they're really good at receiving. And what does Jesus say when he's angry with his disciples? He says, if you can't become like these children, you'll never receive the kingdom of God. And then we see this truth paralleled and, and, and reinstated once again when this wealthy man, fully capable, has all of the resources, he comes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
What must I do? And when Jesus tells him to sell everything that he owns and to give it to the poor and come and follow him, he's not saying do these things so that you'll be worthy of inheriting the kingdom of God. If you do these good deeds, then I'll accept you. What Jesus recognized is that this man's wealth, the love that this man had for his wealth, was the very thing that was preventing him from becoming like a child and entering into the kingdom of God. He wasn't asking him to just do and perform and check off one more box. He was saying, this is the thing that's taking God's spot. If you want God to reign in your life, get rid of this thing. Give it to those who need it. See, sometimes the very things that we consider to be blessings from God, these earthly blessings that we get to experience here on this side of heaven, those can be the very things that take God's place in our hearts. I've noticed in my own life that I might be worshiping God with my mouth. I might even be professing God's worthiness and, 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 and praising his name. But really what I'm doing is worshiping the blessings that I've perceived God to give me. Um, we're about to start this new study, Living Our Beliefs. This is a book by Kenneth Carter. And once we wrap up Disciple, within the next couple of weeks, we're going to do, we're going to go through this book together on Tuesday mornings or on Sunday mornings. I'm sure that'll be announcement in the next couple of weeks. But Jerry gave this book to me about a month ago, and I read through it, and he talks a lot about idolatry throughout this book. And he says that in the Western world, some of the most prevalent forms of idolatry, the things that we really white-knuckle, cling to it, um, profess God's name, but really were disciples of success, of consumerism, of hedonism, which is this idea that pleasure and happiness, the pursuit of pleasure and happiness, kind of trumps everything else in this life. When we think about success, all of us in here probably have a different definition of what success means. And it's not even bad to want that job promotion, to want to be able to provide for your family, to want to be financially stable, to want to be able to take a vacation. Those aren't bad things, but it's when we become disciples of success that we get in trouble. Consumerism. Listen, I love to shop. I love it. Probably too much. Honestly, I'm preaching to myself in this moment. But one of the things that I love is to buy gifts for my friends on their birthdays, to buy Christmas presents for my family members. It is one of my favorite things to do. That's not a bad thing. But when the obsession with acquiring more and more and more starts to rule my life, starts to influence my decisions... When I get into that thought pattern that is all over the place in this culture that says, if you get this, then you'll be happy. If you have this, then you'll be content. I'm becoming a disciple of consumerism. That's where I get into trouble. Same thing with hedonism. Pleasure is a gift from God, right? There are moments that we can Ha experience pleasure throughout the course of our life, but when we become um, enslaved to the pursuit of pleasure, when we are no longer willing to go without so that someone else can have what they need, when we're no longer willing to lay down our life for one another, when we're no longer willing to be inconvenienced, we're disciples of the pursuit of pleasure. And we're in the wrong place. I want to read this, this quote from this book um, that Kenneth Carter wrote. He says, Idolatry distorts reality. It robs us of abundant life and thwarts God's plan for the world. The idols of success, consumerism, hedonism, nationalism, individualism, rationalism, racism, sexism, violence, and institutional religion distort reality 
destroy creation and community, and create enormous suffering. Such idols are causing the deaths of millions of people each year from poverty. Idolatry is killing millions by violence and depleting the earth's resources. Although adequate resources exist to provide for the basic needs for food, shelter, education, medical care, and clothing to all people on the earth, the pursuit of false gods is resulting in millions of God's children being deprived of those necessities. Oftentimes, we look at the world around us and we feel overwhelmed when we see the destruction caused by war, when we see um, the corruption of government institutions, when we see our educational system and the teachers that are underpaid and overworked, when we see our landfills that are overflowing with the trash that we are producing, and we can look at all of that and get overwhelmed and say, well, there's nothing we can do. The world is just a broken place. One thing that we have to recognize is that the brokenness in this world is often caused by people becoming disciples of the wrong thing. It's caused by the idolatry of success, of greed, of wealth, of consumerism, of acquiring more and more and more. When God commanded us to have no other gods before him, he wasn't just saying that for the heck of it. He wasn't doing it to be mean. It's because he knows what happens when us, when we and our humanity elevate anything over the love of God. The kindness, the mercy, the grace of God, the sovereignty of God. When we become disciples of the wrong thing, the worst of us comes out. But when we walk in the discipleship of Jesus Christ, we love ourselves well, we love each other well, and we continue to grow in love for God. We can look at the world and feel overwhelmed and kind of, you know, wipe our hands of it and say, well, there's nothing we can do, but what we can do is start with us. We might not be able to twist the arms of the most powerful politicians, but what we can do is ensure that we are disciples of Jesus Christ, that we are walking in the love that God has for us. And how do we do that? We continue to read the word of God we learn about the context of this book. We learn about the history. We learn the richness and the depth of these words that God has for us. We continue to pray. We continue to engage in our spiritual disciplines. We enter into community and fellowship with one another. We engage with the Holy Spirit and we say, God, show me where I have elevated anything over you. Show me the areas in my life where I've become a disciple of even good things, being a good mother, being a good father, being a good employee, making sure that my family is financially secure. Again, these are good things, but we don't serve these things. We serve the one and true God who loves us, who guides us, and who helps us continue to be the hands and feet of Christ that we've been called to be. And as we close out this morning together, what I want to encourage you to do, even as we sing this last song, to just pray your own prayer. Say, God, will you show me the areas that I have other things reigning in my life where you are supposed to be my Lord? Will you show me the places that I've become a disciple to the wrong things? We would be fools to think that today we can decide to put no other gods 
above God, the one true God, and that we're good to go, ready, set, we're, we're never going to struggle with that again. This is a daily choice that we have to make. This is why it's so important that we're in tune, that we are listening for the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit will convict us with kindness. The Holy Spirit will lead us to change, and the Holy Spirit will ensure that we continue to grow in our discipleship with Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for these words that you've given us that we read this morning. And we're grateful for the fact that it's not by what we can do, but it's by what you've done for us that we are invited into the kingdom of God. I ask that you would teach us how to receive like children, that you would teach us to assume the posture of a child ready to receive from its father. And I ask this morning that you would point out the areas in our life where we have elevated other things above you, that you would help us restore the order in our life that needs to be there, that we would submit to your lordship, that we would continue to grow in love for ourselves, for those around us, and for you, that we might be faithful disciples of Christ. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Would you all stand with me as we sing this last song? Your kingdom is coming, your kingdom is here, alive in our waiting, at work in our tears, so come to us quickly, forever I pray. with the knowledge that the King of Heaven reigns in our life. May we continue to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ, that we would serve others the way he asked us to. Amen. Y'all have a good rest of your Sunday, and we will see you next week.